Now, in this next uh, CBL video, what I'm gonna do, this is actually a part two of the previous uh, video in which we talked about a long-term follow-up of hydraulic condensation and another tooth that had an MB2 kind of uh, decision-making scenario. Uh, today, we're gonna talk about the same patient who seems to have had a number of teeth that we had to deal with uh, over the past uh, decade or so. And this one uh, was the canine tooth, his maxillary right canine, which he came to see me for, uh, for a diagnosis and obviously he had cervical invasive cervical root resorption, which happens following orthodontics. He had adult orthodontics and so on. Uh, or it can happen as a result of trauma or a number of other possible factors, including idiopathic reasons. And the treatment here was to do a non-surgical root canal therapy and then follow up and potentially do surgery. And we ended up doing uh, kind of both on him. And this is that case. Okay, so this is a cervical root resorption repair on the same patient that I did the, uh, the first and second molar on the previous CBL. So this uh, cervical root resorption, as we know, starts from these, the, uh, these odontoclasts that attach to the cervical area of the tooth that has been denuded of cementum or pre-cementum and starts this resorptive process. In this particular case, this was a transgingival uh, type of a resorptive defect that was causing food trapping and a gingival abscess. He's on the buccal aspect of the tooth. So as usual, we start from the CBCT. And you can see here that based on the image here, what we have is the cervical area right below the CEJ, a fairly large defect, right gingival to the CEJ on the buccal aspect of the tooth, which is in fact our saving point because as you know, uh, a, a, a kind of a term that I have used uh, or if you will coined in my resorptive defects is this term called surgical accessibility, which is a determining factor for treating these resorptive defects. And that is a key point here in which you always decide whether the tooth is surgically accessible later on for actual surgical repair before you partake in an attempt to save the tooth through non-surgical repair. So given the fact that this tooth has a heterosate classification three and almost four with the resorptive defects surrounding the pulp, we always have to start from a non-surgical process, but considering the fact that this is almost transgingival and supracrestal, then we also have to do a surgical repair immediately after since food trapping of uh, defects in this area is a problem. So we start by doing our non-surgical root canal therapy using still some TCA trichloroacetic acid to cause coagulation necrosis of the resorptive cells beyond the area where we can reach. And root canal therapy is completed using hydraulic condensation. I use putty right around the area where this resorptive defect was following doing hydraulic condensation, an area apical to that. And so we start with our surgical repair almost, uh, well actually we don't do this immediately because we have to let the uh, putty material to set. So here I think we waited about a week or so after before we went on to reflect the flap. And uh, we just gonna do a very small flap since we don't need to reach the apex. And this is merely a, a intrasocular flap to address the gingival area. Oh, I don't know if you guys saw, but in the pre before we started, there was a little bit of a gingival black triangle right in the mesial area of the canine. So we already had some recession as a result of this resorptive defect. So now what we do is as soon as we get started and we expose the area, we will go ahead and uh, remove the resorptive defect using here a diamond bar and I'm removing the, uh, the, the, the kind of the resorptive area, creating a nice little pocket that I can then fill. And I'm going to use BC liner, which is a um, kind of a, a dual cure and um, self etching and self bonding type of a resin ionomer that's been optimized to use with the bioceramics. And after getting now down to the putty that you could see and that black line that you could see was in fact the coagulation necrosis of those resorptive cells right there. And now we try to use a couple of epi pellets to see if we can control the bleeding. And if there's still more bleeding, you really have to have a very dry field before you can place the BC liner. And so we're trying to get a little bit of uh, cautery here to stop the bleeding from these uh, bleeders. And you could use lasers or just heat. And uh, proceed now to just enlarge the opening and give myself a little bit of a bevel so that I can have better retention from the BC liner, which is going to uh, actually attach to both the enamel as well as the dentin here. So while it is a self-etching and self-bonding material, the BC liner, I, in this particular case, since you're gonna have to deal with shear forces, I would like to do at least some etching. Uh, 
bonding is obviously preferable, but since this area is kind of difficult to isolate from a, um, a bleeding point of view, I wanted to kind of get this thing going on a quicker uh, side and etching and bonding thought I would add a little bit more time. I mean, bonding at least, using a bonding agent. So I proceeded to etch and dry, and now I'm using the tooth colored BC liner here. It's, it's nice as it comes in two shades. So while I use the blue BC liner almost 98, 99% of the time so that I can have better contrast and be able to see it, uh, here, obviously, for aesthetic reasons, you're not going to use a blue BC liner in the cervical area of a canine for this patient. Um, especially because I really liked him, he was such a nice guy. And um, we go ahead and uh, go ahead and use the tooth colored one. And you can see the application of the BC liner in this area is fairly easy. The flow of the material is really ideal for these types of situations. And then you just have to remember that you have to wait using the orange filter so that the light doesn't actually start a premature setting of the um, material. About 30 seconds or so to, for the self etching and the self bonding to take place before you begin to etch the, uh, the material. If you etch, uh, I'm sorry, before you uh, cure and light cure the, the material. If you light cure too quickly, you're going to end up getting uh, uh, no bonding and too quick of a polymerization shrinkage that prevents the etching and bonding to take place. So you can see now after the bonding, the material looks uh, very good and well adapted. But what's nice is using any of your polishers would be very helpful in this point to just kind of get that little extra shine and smooth surface on the uh, on the material. I'm using here Brassless Beer Shine polishers, uh, which is a really nice product and it allows you to have this fine surface of the BC liner and as we know in areas where we have transgingival restorations you want to end up having a very very nice and smooth surface you don't end up getting too much accumulation of plaque and you can see that transition uh, here has no edges and no lines to accumulate plaque and food you want to have a very smooth surface in these types of uh, restorations you could consider this to be a very very deep uh, class 5 restoration except it's not gingival or transgingival as it actually crosses from the bone all the way up to the um, oral cavity and that's because it is in the oral cavity is not you don't want to use the putty you want to use bc liner because it has a far better surface polishing characteristics and you can see that after we did the uh, suturing the area is nice and closed and this is how we started with the resorptive defect and following endo and the placement of the bc liner you cannot really see very well the bc liner in this uh, area since it is almost the same density as dentin but uh, we had very good adaptation and sutures were placed and I always use self-absorbing sutures and we can see that a month later when a patient came back for a follow-up everything is doing well there is further healing that's necessary at this point I'm world famous <laughs> I love it. a big smile there yeah. and it's so nice I saw him uh, a year later on uh, for just recently and when I did the other endos on the other two teeth that I did on the previous uh, CBL and we finished up and we have a one-year follow-up he still has a tooth and I expect him to keep this tooth for much much longer he did very well and the healing is complete and he has no more issues with getting food trapped underneath those uh, defective areas All right, so I hope this case was also informative in the sense of how and when do you use the uh, non-surgical revision and what kind of technique you use for it. And also, more importantly, how do we manage the non-surgical repair of these uh, uh, invasive cervical root resorption when parts of the lesion are going to be exposed to the oral cavity? What are some of the ways? Now, of course, I have a whole presentation on this uh, invasive cervical root resorption, which I will probably share with you at some point down the line. But in the meantime, uh, don't forget to follow me on social media and on Instagram and in different places, and also to like and share this video if you liked it and you enjoyed it. And until next video, for Real Dendo, I'm Ali Nase, and let's save some teeth.